are there any insights you can share regarding the flow of smart money? There were a few tokens that people kind of laughed off or brushed off as not serious, like Shiba Inu and sort of certain dog coins. And I remember at some point people were complaining because um, the smart money dashboards and nonsense were showing that smart money addresses were buying Shiba Inu tokens. And and a lot of people thought, well, this this must mean that, you know, the this, this smart money is not so smart or there's something wrong with your dashboards. But it, funnily enough, the prices actually pumped quite dramatically after these smart money addresses had been scooping up the Shiba Inu tokens. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben, and as usual, I'll be the host of today's podcast. Today, we have Alex Zvanovic, the founder of Nanzen, a blockchain data analytics platform. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, so, you know, I, I already gave a hint about what Nanzen is, but could you just tell me a little bit about yourself and how and why you founded uh, Nansen. Yeah. So um, yeah. So my name is Alex Vanovic. I'm the CEO and one of the three co-founders uh, of Nansen. I'm uh, located not too far away from you, across the uh, across the the sea or the water uh, in Singapore. I guess you're in Malaysia, right? Um, and uh, effectively, so what we do at Nansen is we uh, use blockchain data. Uh, for trading and investment purposes. That's what our customers use our data for. And we enrich the on-chain data uh, with uh, wallet labels, entity information, behavioral tags, and so on, which makes that data about you know, 100 times more useful, I would, I would estimate. Um, and so our customers use this data to uh, discover new opportunities, to perform due diligence, and to set up alerts so they can get notified when important transactions happen on the blockchain. So that's nonsense. My own personal background uh, is in artificial intelligence. I graduated uh, from the University of Edinburgh many years ago in 2010 um, with a master's in AI. And uh, I started my own company shortly after, then went into management consulting for a few years, where I worked with different industries than crypto, everything from seafood to luxury retail. Uh, now, luxury retail is becoming a bit more relevant with NFTs. Uh, it's like yeah, Bored yeah, Apes. Yeah. Bored Apes the feels a bit like good. Gucci. Yeah, it's the new Beveling Good, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so worked with data science for many years in 2017, discovered Ethereum, and the rest is history. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty great. A background, a lot of expertise in different industries. <laughs> I hope. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, you, you talked about Nanzen, right? And how it's essentially a, it's simplifying data, right? It's kind of like what EtherScan does, but this is more granular. So could you share a little bit about what the types of products or data that Nansen uh, focuses on or offers? Yeah, so I think the, the thing that we do extremely well is what I would call enriched on-chain data. So mm -hmm. um, you know, you could, in theory, spin up uh, an Ethereum node and use something like Ethereum ETL, which my co-founder Evgeny created, to pull out the data and start querying it with like a SQL database or something. So yep. there is no there is no kind of strategic advantage, I would say, in having on-chain data alone as a data company. However, there is this large uh, unknown piece, which is kind of that, that you don't get for free if you pull out data from uh, a node, which is about the entities of accounts. And so, you know, which, uh, which address is owned by, uh, you know, which exchange, for example. And so we have more than 100 million uh, addresses labeled and, and tagged up with Nansen. And 
it just makes it a lot easier to answer lots of analytical questions. For example, where do you have the most liquidity for a specific token? You could look at what the exchanges are telling you in terms of like trading volume and so on. But with Nonsense, you can actually see how many tokens are sitting in the wallets of the exchanges. And so yeah. that that's, you know, that's one example. Um, another example is if you wanted to understand like who are the either like the influencers buying certain NFTs, like what tokens are they buying? And you could set up alerts for that. Or, you know, which tokens are being scooped up by certain known crypto funds or hedge funds, VC funds, etc. So, uh, yeah, you can actually use uh, Nonsense for a lot of different things. But I think generally the, the three uh, areas I mentioned earlier were like you're trying to discover opportunities, you're performing due diligence by digging into each specific project and trying to understand what's actually going on here besides the price chart. And then setting up these alerts. That's how I would say that you could use our data. I think uh, one of the biggest problems with blockchain is the swaths of data, right? There's too much data. Mm. And I think Nanzen is trying to bridge the gap between, uh, you know, what's happening to the data and trying to show who's moving what around. Right? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great summary. Uh, and the mission of the company is to surface the signal. Mm -hmm. And that means a lot of it is about curation. Right. It's not yeah. about putting every single piece of information in front of our customers, but rather mm -hmm. to put the stuff that we think you actually will care about, the stuff that is actually important to you. That's what we have to focus on. So we do have a lot of that's kind of the philosophy of the company. And it's the guiding principle by which we design uh, the product. And surfacing the signal is kind of the, the thing that we always come, come back to if we have a product discussion and should we do it this way or that way? Well, which is, what is the way that surfaces the signal best, right? That's kind of yep. at the end of the day, the principle. And, you know, I, I, I'm an agent user myself as well. So I'm quite familiar. With Happy to hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. So I, I, I'm curious, you know, recently Nanzen just released a new uh, feature uh, regarding AI. Uh, you yourself hmm. have an AI background. Could you elaborate more on that? Absolutely. So I guess what you're referring to is the NFT price estimator. Yes. And so this, I mean, depending on where you're listening to this podcast from, people will have different, you could use different analogies to explain what this is. But effectively, uh, it's something where you can plug in a specific NFT and you get a machine learning powered price estimate of that NFT. And so <clears throat> to listeners in the US, uh, you might be familiar with something like the Zestimate from Zillow, where you can plug in an address and you get an estimate for your uh, for your house. Um, and you know there are lots of other things, but like appraising, you know, property appraising, yep. you know, wine or art or whatever it is, right? This has been done for a long time, and it's very important that for you know things that aren't fungible you often need to rely on other methods than a pure kind of exchange rate uh, to get the, the value of it. That's why, that's why you need something like this in the first place. Like building a Bitcoin price estimator, I mean, you could do that to try to predict the price or something like that, but, but to, you don't need to estimate what is the value of one Bitcoin right now. You can just look right. at an exchange, right? But so um, the way we do this, you know, high level, is that we look at the past transactions of items within one NFT collection. So it could be bored apes, could be azukis, it could be mutant apes, doodles, what have you. And um, we look at past transactions and we also look at the traits of the different NFTs. And so, for example, uh, there are a few traits that make some NFTs more valuable, typically because they're more rare. But it could also be other factors, just because the market really likes those, those features. You know, if it's a, you know, a blue kimono pudgy penguin, or if it's a, a silver pixie azuki, or whatever it is. So yep. the model, instead of having to sort of having a human spend a lot of time trying to appraise the stuff, which first of all would take a lot of time, and second of all, you would have to do this for like tens of thousands of NFT collections potentially. Yep. We've trained. Um, We've trained models to do this, right? So, and the models are actually pretty good. They are, you can benchmark them in different ways. 
but they have like a single digit uh, percentage absolute error, Me- meaning, you know, uh, and, and I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, and maybe the numbers will even change as we uh, publish the podcast because we're constantly trying to improve them, right? But just imagine that you have an error rate on the price because you can you can make a price prediction and then what if tomorrow the that particular piece gets bought or sold um you can just see how far away you were uh, on your yep. price estimate which is pretty cool like you can you can assess the performance of the model pretty much on a running basis assuming that there's some degree of liquidity in the collection and so <clears throat> um we're we're much better than random, which is good, <laughs> and we're of course much better than the uh, just the average price that you would get as well. So that means the model is picking up some signal in the data we have, and I think it's frankly going to be, it's just going to get better because there are many different ideas on how you could make it better. For example, does the price history, or rather the provenance, the ownership history of an NFT, does that matter for its price? I would imagine yes. Like if Snoop Dogg or Jay Z owned a pudgy penguin, I'm pretty sure that that pudgy penguin would be worth way more after. Yeah, <laughs> and and so stuff like that has not yet been baked into the model. But I think as you know, as we iterate, we like to uh, sort of roll out minimum viable products at Nansen and then try to iterate and get improve them. And the price estimator is is just another example of that. There are actually a lot of price estimators in the market now, right? But I don't think any of them use AI. I think most of them just use price history, you know, those simple rarity tools traits. Some of them do estimate price, but I don't think they're, they're completely different beast. If I'm not mistaken, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there are a few uh, different uh, approaches out there. I'm not sure. Actually, I, I can't claim we're the only, you know, AI powered pricing mm-hmm. uh, estimator. So, so I, I don't actually know about that. But I'm, I'm quite confident that we will, we will definitely have the the most accurate one. So. You know, as Nansen is a data analytics platform, right? And obviously, you have a lot of data. And uh, your team recently released the state of the crypto industry, 2021 report, uh, a few weeks back, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, I just want to use this podcast as well to kind of go through some of the interesting data points or insights that we can get from the report. Uh, you know, many t- topics are covered from NFTs, alt chains, et cetera. And I guess for me, the first question is, uh, are there any insights you can share regarding the flow of smart money for 2021? You know, So just to clarify for the audience, I, uh, Nanzen, they identify their users, certain uh, smart people as smart money. And I guess uh, I, I want to kind of understand what the smart people are doing now you know, in the different industries. So let's just segmentize it to three. Uh, DeFi, alt chains, and NFTs. Mm. Yeah, so um, maybe we can start with I don't know if I don't know if I call this DeFi, but maybe we can call it tokens. I I do remember. Yeah, right. Sure. I I do remember, um, and we also referenced that in uh, the report that there were a few tokens that people kind of laughed off or brushed off as not serious, like Shiba Inu and certain dog coins. And I remember at some point, people were complaining because um, the smart money dashboards and nonsense were showing that smart money addresses were buying Shiba Inu tokens. And, and a lot of people thought, well, this, this must mean that, you know, the, the smart money is not so smart, or there's something wrong with your dashboards. But it, funnily enough, the prices actually pumped quite dramatically after these smart money addresses had been scooping up the Shiba Inu tokens. So, so I think like that's one somewhat counterintuitive example of how smart money addresses perhaps, you know, maybe they are a few levels higher than the rest of us mere mortals and they kind of understand trends better. Uh, and so maybe they're not uh, believing in like the Shiba Inu uh, becoming like a global peer-to-peer currency or something like that. Mm-hmm. But they are, they are actually betting uh, on that this will become popular or some kind of macro sentiment or whatever it is. So that's, that's one example. Um, if we, if we look at, um, I think you said, uh, NFTs was the other one that you were thinking about. Um, 
we we have some uh, stats that show how there are some addresses that consistently outperform the market when it comes to flipping NFTs. And we've actually broken it down into several different categories where you can look at um, like NF smart money, um, smart minters or smart NFT minters, smart NFT hodlers, uh, and, and smart NFT early adopters. Maybe yeah. if you bought you know, like crypto punks and so on. And uh, it, it's pretty interesting to see like many of these addresses do consistently appear also in new collections. And it makes it it makes it possible for you to spot, you know, if there's any interest in a collection by this smart NFT crowd. Um, and you know, there are, there are several, I guess there are several examples where I've seen lots of smart money uh, accumulation uh, recently. But uh, I think Azuki's, you know, is one where you, if you just look at the first page of Hodlers, it's pretty much almost like fifty percent smart money addresses or something like that. Um, and I think a few other ones. Uh, there were some smart money addresses very early in on Loot, which was yep. uh, quite relevant last year. Um, although many of those seem to have mostly been flipping them, and so there were a few addresses that made incredible returns on Loot by flipping it, uh, minting it early, uh, and then, or even just buying it early and then selling it at a much higher price later. And then, so that's like some, some examples on NFTs. And there are also some NFT influencers that are, you know, very, very easy to spot in, in nonsense. Like Pranksy is a good example, uh, consistent in the top 10. Um, Bingaling, who, for a very long time, was the top holder of board apes, more than a hundred board apes um, to his name. Um, and then there are a few other ones, like uh, there's one we've tagged Wifey Whale, uh, which yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and and yeah, you, you have a few other ones uh, in there as well, which are quite interesting to to, to look at. So this, I think, the NFT space in particular is quite interesting because it's so, so socially. Um, yep it's a very social type of uh, investing and you you always want to know who else is buying this because if you're the only one you know buying some nft collection it's never going to take off like you need to have some really strong backers with you it's not too dissimilar for say for like venture investing and things like that but it becomes even more extreme in a way with with nfts um so you, you mentioned DeFi nfts and what was the last thing you, you mentioned as a as an area um, for smart money like flows. Off-chain. Off-chain. Yeah, all chain. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's another really interesting one because I've said this before. Like I personally thought that Ethereum would be like the only smart contract platform, pretty mm-hmm. much that that would really have you know usage. But I think maybe late 2020 with um, Binance Smart Chain now BNB Chain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they they kind of proved that. There's actually a lot of appetite out there for other chains that make different trade-offs when it comes to decentralization, security, costs, um, and speed. So, um, so that 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 theme actually continued in 2021, and you can see, for example, um, Avalanche, which is a I I would definitely not put it in the same category as BSC or BNB chain. Um, you know, BNB chain is is pretty much uh, an Ethereum fork with with more centralized security, right? Yep. Uh, and of course, much higher throughput, lower gas costs, um, and so on. I think Avalanche is more complex, but it does have this EVM um, chain. I think it, I think it's the C chain. I saw that screw up yep. the, the letters, but I, I think it's so, the C chain as well. <laughs> yeah, and so and so one cool thing that you saw in 2021 was a lot more activity in, for example, Avalanche, but also a lot more activity on Polygon and Phantom and many of these other EVM chains, right? And I think especially the crypto native crowd became more comfortable bridging assets between these different chains and started to use them. That that was one thing that happened. The other thing that happened was that anyone who was new to DeFi and NFTs and so on, they, they came to Ethereum and they say, I have to pay fifty dollars in transaction fees yeah. to, to make a transaction. That's crazy. Is there no other way? 
well, maybe you can try BNB Chain or Avalanche or Phantom or even some of the L2s like Arbitrum. So I think that's the other reason why you have so much interest in usage of these chains. Um, and when it comes to smart money, we can also track some of the what the smart money is doing across different chains. And you know, maybe not a surprise, but the smart money is also using uh, other chains, right? In general. Yeah. So if you look at Avalanche, if you look at Phantom, I think Phantom in particular, there's been a lot of smart money interest in in yield farming. Um, I think Phantom is kind of known for being this almost like DeFi OG chain, uh, probably because yeah. of And Andre Kronjes. <laughs> yeah. Andre Kronjes involvement, right? So um so that's one where you you've definitely seen like smart liquidity providers and so on uh be more active. When it comes to NFTs, this is, you know, I would say largely of course you have NFTs on other chains than Ethereum, but Ethereum is still the big one for NFTs. And I yeah. think a lot of it has to do with the marketplace, you know, of OpenSea being still very dominant. So there's, you know, there's more stuff that's going to happen there. And then there are a few other chains that I didn't mention, like Terra, Solana, which had tons of uh, activity in 2021. We are only now adding functionality for those. So I don't, I can't come back and, and give you lots of data on that yet. Yeah. But if we talk again in a few months, then I will have a lot more data. Uh, but I mean, I know from other sources that, uh, these ecosystems have like millions of users that are engaging with them, which is very different from some of the quote unquote Ethereum killers back in like 2018. Like these, these are blockchains with genuine, you know, real activity on them. You know, I'm curious because you mentioned we have smart money for DeFi and smart money for NFTs. Do the users ever overlap in the sense that, you know, there's smart money person who's also good at nfts and DeFi. yes uh the, the answer is yes um and we actually had a research uh post written about um some of these segments this was actually before we had smart money nft segments so we should mm -hmm. probably redo that analysis again but there is there is a some correlation between DeFi activity and nft activity uh, I know anecdotally that there are a lot of people who are interested in NFTs, but have zero interest in crypto otherwise. Yeah. So I think that's, it's, I would, and on, on the other side, there are like DeFi investors who just don't get NFTs. Although I think there are fewer and fewer of those now. It seems like every day, some crypto OG who used to be hesitant on NFTs uh, becomes red pilled and like yeah. they just get get an nft profile pick or something like that so it seems like that that part if it, it feels like the the crypto ogs and the DeFi ogs they they all eventually accept nfts but i don't know if the nft crowd actually gets that interested in say DeFi or token investing um that this is more you know anecdotal but there is a research post that we wrote about DEX traders and NFT traders where we look to pair these, these different segments and we sort of put um, different addresses into the, the quadrant there between those two axes. I think it would be cool to do it again, though, with um, updated smart money NFT um, labels. So that, that's a good tip. Maybe I'll go back and, and ask if the team can look into it. I think one of the biggest takeaways of 2021 is NFTs, right? And you yourself, uh, so far, we've been talking a lot about NFTs. And I think the one thing people want to know is, you know, how do I get better at NFT trading, right? So, for example, I actually look at the report and according to the report, the top 10 NFT traders on Ethereum uh, cumulatively earned about 46,000 ETH or $185 million in profit, which is crazy. Mm. Right. So, so my question is, what separates these traders from the average trader? You know, does Nanzen have any insights on this? And if so, is there any advice <laughs> that you can give for yeah. budding NFT flippers? Yeah, this is that's a really good question. Um, let me let me think about it like this. Um, I would say first, first of all, there are maybe common things that these uh, investors do, but they. One thing they all do is that they stay up to date with 
what's happening in the NFT market. There's you can't. I don't think the NFT space is one where you can. I mean, I could be wrong here, but I don't think it's uh, something where you can come up with one very simple playbook and then you just apply that same playbook to everything that comes out. There's certainly there are some elements of this. Obviously, um, a lot of mo- people made money just by being very early minting NFTs and then flipping them later, right? So, for example, if you can, uh, if you if you're monitoring the mint master section in Nansen you will see in real time what are the new NFT collections that are being minted and how what's the FOMO level, which is just how many unique addresses are minting this, uh, this address, right? And so that's one way to discovering those opportunities. You need to know about the NFT collection in the first place. And yep. what better way to know about an NFT collection than to see it in real time being minted on a blockchain? So that's one thing that you could use Nansen to do. Um, and then the next step, like once, let's say that you have, actually even before you mint, if you want to be get even more, comf- uh, more comfort and, and conviction, you can drill down on that NFT collection in NFT God mode, and you can figure out who's actually minting or buying these NFTs. And so figuring out who are the people behind the NFT collection is another very important thing because there are, I think, uh, something like 100 NFT collections launched every single day on Ethereum. Um, And and so that means not all of them will perform very well. And one quick uh, principle is that you probably want to make sure that there are some big names or some strong backers behind the NFT collection. So that's another thing that you would do in NFT God mode. And this is now about the due diligence part, right? Yep. And so figuring figuring that out. And the funny thing is that there's kind of like a meta circular thing going on here because there's this Twitter account called Mev Collector, MEV Collector, yep. who posted on Twitter uh, on how they went from, I think something like 11 ETH to like 800 ETH or something in 30 days. I can't remember the, the exact numbers. Um, and he kind of walks through his process. And the first, tweet is like the the, t- the main tool he uses is nonsense and so that's to me it's pretty funny because at this point he is actually a smart money uh wallet but he kind of became a smart money wallet by partially by using nonsense and following this process so it creates this kind of funny feedback loop um where he became the the segment that he was tracking in a way and so and so i think that's that's kind of high level how how you can use Nansen and and of course some of the smart money will be using the same process. They might be of course they're using different tools in addition to that. You have to actually make the trades, which could be OpenSea, could be LuxRare, could be Gem or GE. Um, you know, lots of different uh, marketplaces now. Although OpenSea is by far the, the dominant one. Um, and then I think it's always good to you know reflect a bit on. It's it's almost like NFTs are kind of like a an evolutionary process, right? Where you had let's say CryptoPunks, right? Ten thousand unique NFTs, etc. Then someone comes along and they take that same concept, but they do a slight mutation on it. Like they have some incremental idea, and maybe that's like hash masks or something. And then oh cool, hash mask has this concept. Then someone sees that and they create like similar thing, but with another slight mutation. And so I think in that sense, um, you can apply some of the same sort of rules. So there, to some extent, you can argue there's a playbook. But then at the same time, not all the rules of the playbook will work every time because of these mutations that happen, because something is different every time. And so, yeah, that's, that's another thing to re- reflect on. Um, so anyway, to, to make a, um, a very long answer a bit shorter, I would say, uh, obviously, you should use Nansen. That's what I would recommend. And it's like nine nine bucks to test it out for a week. Um, and following the principles of dis- discovering opportunities, performing due diligence, and um, setting up smart alerts. So you could have a smart alert on the address of MEV collector, for example. Or you could have smart alerts that actually calculate uh, mints 
unique mentors for an NFT collection so you don't have to stay glued in front of your screen. So anyway, I, I would follow that principle with Nansen and then I would consider um, looking into some of these other ones who've succeeded like MEV Collector has a good Twitter thread on this. Yeah, sounds amazing. You know, I, I personally like collecting NFTs as well and one of the things that I think you kind of mentioned but not directly is keeping up to date with information. So I think over the past few months, the NFT cycle has become shorter and shorter. So narratives uh, come and go really fast. I think the most recent one was anime and to a certain extent, even China-based NFTs. Uh, now now mm. it, it kind of moves on, moves on. So I, I think another tip is for people to keep track of this, these macro macro trends. Oh yeah, I think the more the longer you stay in crypto, the more you realize how important narratives are. Yeah, and yeah, NFTs are no exception. I agree. Now that we've discussed NFTs a bit, I want to redirect the conversation somewhere else. Um, in the report as well, uh, there was some interesting data regarding the Ronin side chain, uh, essentially GameFi, which highlights its exponential growth. You know, users reached one point one million users on November nineteenth. And the game itself has raked in over 1.3 billion US dollars in revenue. And I think the overarching picture here is that, you know, it's a growing trend of gaming chains. Uh, what are your thoughts on this trend? Mm. Where to start? This is a, yeah. it's a big topic. Um, yeah. so, so it seems, I, I was actually playing uh, Nintendo Switch last night for the first time in a while. and. I was playing uh, Rocket League. Maybe you know this game. Oh, yeah, yeah. I play Rocket League too. <laughs> Amazing. And and it just struck me like once you've been red-pilled on NFTs, I, had, I don't see the point of buying any of these items unless they're also NFTs. Like uh, you're buying skins or buying banners or whatever it is, right? It's just, it seems kind of pointless to me now. Whereas if you actually own the NFT and you can like bring it with you out of the game, and you can trade it on marketplaces. Maybe you can import it into another game. It just adds so much more uh, value to the, the items. So I was just thinking about this uh, last night when I was playing Rocket League. Um, and I think Axie Infinity is the game that kind of opened Pando Pandora's box here. Right. That they pretty much you know, created their own category of play to earn, um, which of course has been. I think very controversial, like some people think it's totally unsustainable or even a Ponzi scheme. Other people think that, you know, it's, it's revolutionary and, and it will change gaming. I'm as maybe, as you can tell, I'm, I'm in the second category. Um, but, uh, but I also think that they are literally the first to, to really pioneer this space. Right. I mean, of course you've had blockchain games or blockchain, um, powered games in other forms uh, before Axie Infinity as well. But in, in the form of like play to earn and going really big, reaching millions of people, Axie Infinity is, is definitely the pioneer. So um, I think they're, they're still the first, which means there's still a lot of stuff you have to figure out, right? Yep. It's not like they just hit the nail on the head and were perfect in the first iteration. I think there's tons more that needs to be done. Um, but I do think that I do think a few things uh, around this topic. So, uh, first of all, I, I I'm pretty uh, sure that Ronin will get more games than X Infinity. Maybe that's not a very bold prediction, but Ronin as a chain seems like it's re really nicely positioned to be almost like an app store of blockchain games because you have millions of players already there. You have like guilds that have integrated with Ronin. It's like a very nice blockchain for noobs in that you can get free transactions, like 100 free transactions a day. Not sure that's still the case, but it used to be that that way. Um, and they so just introduce uh, raw fees. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. And, and so that means you don't have any free uh, transactions I think at the now or? it's 20. 20 free transactions and after oh, okay. you pay raw. Got it. That makes sense, right? So it's still, it's still you can still get mm -hmm. passed with like 20 transactions a day in, in most cases without a problem. And maybe you've started earning some uh, either RON, uh, AXS, or SLP, depending on 
you know, what you're doing on the chain after, after um, getting onboarded. So I think like uh, Ronin is pretty uniquely positioned to be like an app store for, for blockchain games. Um, I don't think they're going to be alone though. I don't think they're going to be like the monopoly for blockchain games. And we talked a bit about Avalanche earlier. I think Avalanche seems pretty interesting because it has this notion of subnets where you can almost spin up your own like smaller blockchains within the same ecosystem and have potentially very low fee transactions, but maybe with different security. And then they're still somehow connected to like the overall Avalanche ecosystem. Um, so that's, I think, pretty interesting and um, might be worth looking at for people who are interested in blockchain games. Um, and then it seems also obvious to me that the NFTs we have today will find new life in blockchain games. If you, like someone's definitely going to create, I mean, maybe they already are, and maybe there are games out there that I haven't tried. but games where you can bring in your board ape or pudgy penguin or whatever and you can somehow use them in the game it's like a seems like an obvious way to bootstrap uh players to a new ecosystem so that's kind of the flip side it's very tempting uh for projects to create their own nfts which most will do right because it's a good way to um bootstrap the funding of projects for example but you might have projects to do the inverse where it's kind of like create a game where you can bring your existing NFTs. And in this way, you don't have to create your new community. You can actually bring in all these other communities to your platform. It's like a different, different model. Um, so, so yeah, the, I mean, there's just so many things to touch on when it comes to blockchain uh, gaming, but I definitely think that uh, this is really just the beginning. And I think this is one of the trends in the short term that's going to drive mainstream adoption of blockchains. There's actually one uh, interesting thing going on, right, for blockchain games, which I think XC is a perfect example. They have their own side chain, but a lot of games are actually starting to bootstrap their own chains as well. And and some people believe that, oh, you know, isn't this going back to the old model where you essentially have a game developer that controls the ecosystem, uh, even though it's a blockchain, but technically it's your own network. Uh, what do you think about that? I think it's uh, I think it's a fair question. Uh, and I think the answer is that it depends a bit. Mm -hmm. If these are genuine, you know, blockchains that, for example, are EVM compatible and they have bridges, and you could bring these assets with you to other chains, although that's not often so easy with NFTs. But if you could do that, then I think that's better than having a complete walled garden um, that you would have on, on most games today, like Rocket League. Um, so, so I think I think there's a spectrum here. I think on the one hand you have the totally centralized, totally walled uh, walled garden approach of today's games. On the other side, you have let's say everyone is on the same blockchain and these assets can freely move between the different ecosystems. And then something like Ronin, you know, is I wouldn't say it's in between. Like it's closer to the blockchain, uh, yep. you know, based based solution. It's also EVM uh, compatible and it has bridges. So you can literally earn SLP and Axie Infinity, claim them on Ronin, bridge them over to Ethereum and sell them on Uniswap. I mean, it might not be the most uh, capital uh, efficient way of doing things, but you can do it if you want to. So, um, so, I don't, so I don't think it's the exact same thing, but I think it's a trend to be a bit cautious of because it, if it gets too tempting to just create your own blockchain, then yeah, you're potentially back to start. Then it becomes really, you know, uh, inconvenient for people to move their assets around. So um, yeah, I, I would say it's it's true that right now the blockchain um, gaming space is pretty fragmented. Uh, but as with many other things, I think over time you will start to see network effects around certain blockchains. I don't know which one it will be. I think Ronin has a good start. Uh, I think Avalanche has some theoretical. Uh, properties that make it interesting. Ethereum, it would have to be on L2s, obviously, because L1 is not very well suited for gaming. Um, but you know, Ethereum is also by far the blockchain with the most network effect, both on users and developers. So if 
you know, some L2 or multiple L2s can figure that out for gaming, that could be promising as well. So now that we talked a little bit about gaming and NFTs, I'm going to segment, segue the question away to another topic. So I think one of the interesting things about Nansen is that uh, they also have like a small DAO section uh, where they track DAO native tokens and wallet activity, right? I guess this was also shared in the report. And one of the things I want to ask is, you know, what kind of inferences can we draw uh, regarding the success or likelihood of the DAO, you know, based on the data we look from a token point of view and wallet activity? Yeah, this is a uh, that's a pretty that's a hard question because it, um, mm -hmm. DAOs are are very, um, I would say, the the solution space of DAOs is very wide. There are mm -hmm. many different types of DAOs, and it's still so early that you don't even have like really basic patterns for DAOs. I mean, you, some have kind of converged uh, on on a few. For example, you have sort of like membership DAOs, which are becoming a bit more popular now. <clears throat> and then you have on the other side, you have sort of uh, DeFi or Treasury based DAOs, where there's a lot of like, there are some parameters that need to be governed, or even a Treasury that has to be managed and you want to decentralize that so you have a DAO for that. That was almost like the, the initial um, version of a DAO. Yeah. But but these types, like just to give you those two, the membership DAO and the sort of DeFi uh, DAO, <clears throat> those are those have very different success criteria, right? So so I think there are maybe some things you can look at is like just simply Again, with NFTs, like who who is owning these tokens? Like who is actually believing in these in, in these DAOs or active in them? Which you can see in like the notable wallet sec uh, section under Token God Mode in Nansen. You can also look at the sort of basic macro stats on number of hodlers, like number of addresses that own the tokens. You can even look at the seniority. So how long have these holders been in this community? Like when, when did they buy their tokens for the first time? Um, and from that data, you can get a better understanding of, you know, what is, what is, what is the on-chain data telling you um, about the activity for the DAO? So I think you have to be, as with many things in crypto, you, you can't expect that it's just like the same playbook and just kind of copy paste everywhere else. You have to think of these as kind of like mutations of each other and then look for some of the basic patterns that you might recognize. For example, you know, uh, some, some strong early backers are behind it. Um, so yeah, those, those are some ways I would approach the DAO token. Uh, one of the last questions regarding the report. Uh, one of the key trends for 2021, right, was the rise of institutional adoption. And however, Nansen identified some obstacles that institutions needed to overcome uh, before entering the crypto space. Could you elaborate more on that? And, you know, even if they aren't or finding ways, how are they finding ways to get exposure? Yeah, the way I've always looked at institutions uh, in crypto is that um, at, the very, at the very least, they need two things. Um, and the first one is information, which is what we are focused mm -hmm. on. So you need to have uh, a way to justify <clears throat> the investment decisions you make uh, as an institution. So information is a must-have. I would say probably the other thing is uh, custody, which has been holding back like quite a few um, institutional players to get active in the space. For example, in 2016 or 17, you didn't have that mature of a custody offering, whereas today you have you know, uh, Fireblocks, Anchorage, uh, Copper, Coinbase Custody, Gemini, like there's lots of cu custody options out there for you to choose from. Um, so I think that's that's probably the, the second thing. And of course, you need to have like the trading venues or if not, then some kind of um, some kind of desk to uh, interface with so that you can you can um, actually trade. Um, so, so I think those are some of the things that I would I would say um, are important when it comes to institutions, and I'm trying to uh, yeah. And so, so um, what I noticed also, and and the report kind of points at this in 2021, 
was that the venture firms started to get more uh, involved. In fact, I think you could argue that 2021 was the year that <clears throat> crypto went mainstream in the venture capital world. Because, of course, you'd had VC firms in the past who invested in crypto, uh, like A16Z and, and many other, yeah, also many other crypto native ones, right? But 2021, it felt to me, was the year that pretty much <laughs> all of venture capital wanted to get exposure to the world of crypto one way or another. And so that, that was, um, I mean, you can see it in, there's tons of press releases of, you know, venture firms starting crypto funds or getting like mandates to invest in crypto. Um, we speak with a lot of these because they're interested in Nonsen as well, right? And actually many big names out there, there, you'd be surprised by how many of these are now actually looking at crypto very, very actively. It's not always about buying actual crypto assets or digital assets. It's often about also investing in companies like exchanges, information providers, custodians uh, as well. So, so there's, yeah, I, I think definitely last, last year um, was the year that venture capital really got their eyes open up for, for crypto and started to take it seriously to the point where there's almost like a flipping. Like you, yes. you have to be active in crypto or, you know, you're, you're not really a venture capital uh, investor. So, um, and then you have to remember that VCs, you know, from the name venture capital, these are like the frontier of investors. Right. These are the people who are, um, you know, the, the first to uh, go into many different markets. So there's still, you know, still going to be many years before the rest of the institutional uh, space makes its way into uh, crypto. But I think it's, it's been pretty clear that uh, there's no going back at this point. And one of the biggest ones recently was Sequoia Capital, right? They announced a $500, $600 million uh, launch. Fun just for crypto. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. And they've already invested in lots of crypto related companies, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, th th it's very exciting actually if you think about it. And you know, on crypto Twitter, you sometimes uh, hear some saltiness about the VCs and all that. But it's a good thing to have people who are investing for the long run in our industry. And yeah. I don't see, I don't see really anything bad. Uh, about these um, VC firms entering the crypto space. I think it's a very healthy thing for the whole industry. Right. I think, you know, we covered a lot of the report and I just kind of want to round off the podcast with uh, two final questions. Uh, firstly, what are your predictions for 2022 in terms of the crypto market? I think on the NFT side, we're going to see more utility be added to existing NFT collections. So I think you'll be able to do more stuff with your NFTs. Uh, that could be you'll get uh, discounts based on which NFTs you hold, um, or you'll be able to use your existing NFTs in, in games or other platforms. You'll get access to uh, maybe websites or even you know, real world events with your NFTs. So that's one thing that I think is gonna happen. The other thing is uh, I think there's gonna be a an insane amount of blockchain games coming out. Uh, I'm not sure how many of the games will actually launch this year, but I do fear that it might become saturated uh, in the sense that it's pretty easy to put together a pitch deck and say you're going to make the next Axie Infinity, but it's not so easy to do it. So I think there, there might be a lot of failures. Uh, I'm not sure they will manifest themselves this year, but I think I do think there's going to be a lot of um, disappointed investors who who thought they invested in the next next Axie Infinity. I do think some of them will succeed. So you know, it's maybe not so uh, different from the ICO boom in 2017, um, and you know, some winners emerge from that, and some really great uh, companies and projects that we still use every day. I mean, think of like zero X, right? That uh, basically is a technology that sits behind lots of other projects uh, that we use. Uh, Matcha, for example, is, yep. is a DEX aggregator that they built, right? So um, so I, I think like, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm, uh, I am bullish on the blockchain gaming space in the short term and in the long run. But I do think there's going to be a lot of <laughs> disappointed investors who might have invested in the wrong game. 
And I'm not sure what's going to happen with the whole guild sector either, but I'm, I'm eager to see how that plays out. Um, and then I think the multi-chain trend is going to continue. I think, uh, I think it's going to play out maybe a bit like video game consoles or browsers or operating systems that some chains will kind of live side by side. Maybe we will, some people will have natural affinity to some of them, like you're a Solana person or you're an Ethereum person, but then you, you can actually, there are ways to get back and forth. And in that sense, it's a bit more different than say, you know, video game consoles or, or browsers, because there you tend to stick with one. Um, and when it comes to DeFi, I think DeFi will also continue to go multi-chain, which means that it will look like DeFi isn't growing or is even shrinking. But in reality, what's happening is that it's just getting spread out on more yep. chains and more different projects. If you look at the totality of DeFi, I think that's going to continue to grow. And finally, what are Nadsen's plans for 2022? We want to um, do a lot of cool uh, things, actually. So I would say the acronym that we use for the, the product side of things is FEW. So F-E-W. So <laughs> the F, I feel like I can't reveal it yet. But um, how should I put it? There will be it will be easier to get access to Nansen for people, um, and so think of this as Nansen has traditionally been a product that you know uh, you had to be a you know crypto native, super degen, very deep into crypto to to use and get access to. I think this year is going to be easier for you to access, and by easier, it can mean that in many different ways. Um, the E stands for enhancement. So that means we're going to be focusing a lot on making the product actually better. So everything from adding more chains to making the user interface easier to use and uh, more personalized as well. And then the W stands for Web3. So we want to, I, I would say Nonsense right now is kind of a Web 2.5 uh, product. It sort of has one leg in the Web 2 world and one leg in the Web 3 world. I, we want to move more towards the Web 3 world where we can make a good use of things like wallets. And you know, you should be able to log in to your Nonsense account with a Web 3 wallet, for example. But there's more fun stuff and interesting stuff you can do beyond that as well. So I think on the product side, a lot of stuff is going to be uh, improved a lot. And there's also more chains coming, Solana, Terra, Arbitrum, Optimism, uh, and probably a lot more. Um, and then in terms of the organization, we want to grow to at least double the headcount. So we're, we've gone from like eight people to 80 in one year. Wow. And I think we'll, we'll probably hit 150, 160 end of this year. Um, and that allows us to do you know a lot more cool things. The last few months, we spent a lot of time like reorganizing the the company and like figuring out how we should be structured so that we can move forward fast with leverage at scale. And we've, I would say we've we've um, we've nailed it now. And now it's about just getting you know people into these positions so that we can move forward. But you have to sometimes slow down in order to to speed up. And that's what we've been what we've been doing on the back end. But uh, I'm pretty hopeful that we will be able to ship a lot of cool features going forward very fast. Hey, and I think that's about it for today's podcast. Thank you so much, Alex, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This podcast is provided as part of the overall information on cryptocurrency contained on our website, is for your general information only, and does not, howsoever, constitute any endorsement, financial or investment advice, nor any solicitation or offer of securities or other financial instruments. CoinGecko and the podcast presenter makes no warranties, implied or express, of any kind in relation to this podcast, including, without limitation, the accuracy and updatedness of its content. All opinions and recommendations there in the podcast are based on the personal opinion of the presenter. Please conduct your own research and procure professional advice should you, at your own risk, decide to howsoever invest or trade in relation to the content contained in the podcast. For the latest crypto prices, visit our website. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up to date on the latest crypto trends.